In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? If you would please put your Bibles down. And I, I, I ask this morning a very special request. I know we ask for prayer that, we, that the, the speaker will be anointed. Yes. And I ask that same thing this morning. Yes. And I ask that you pray that your ears are open to receive yes. this message. Yes. I, I think every preacher on a Sunday morning wants to come and to have everybody bouncing off the walls and jumping around. I don't feel that this morning. I have a heavy burden on myself this morning. When I found out that I was coming here, I, I went into prayer and immediately, immediately, this was the message that I felt to preach. And I ask that as we go into prayer right now, that you pray that God will open your heart to receive this. And God, we come before you this morning. We ask that your spirit move in a mighty way, Jesus. God, I ask that you allow your anointing to rest on me. Give me the words to say, Lord. I ask that you use me as a vessel to speak your word this morning. God, I ask that you soften our hearts, Lord that you help us to receive the message that you have for us this morning. I thank you. You may be seated. Before we get into our opening text, I want to set the background for just a few moments here today. And I apologize. My title is The Agony of a Loving God. The Agony of a Loving God. But as in the background for our, before our opening text, God has just finished creating the universe, speaking everything into existence. The unimaginable beauty of the oceans and the mountains and the stars, all of the planets and the solar systems. God has just finished creating it all. And as he is finishing up his work, we find that God stoops down and he picks up some dirt, and he begins to form man. And as he begins to form man, I can imagine that within the mind of God, there is this back and forth conversation as his righteousness begins to question this creation. I can imagine that God begins to question within himself, why are you creating this man? Look at all the beautiful things you have created. Look at the way the wind moves the clouds through the mountains. Look at the way that the ocean crashes against the sand. Why are you creating this man? Please understand the Bible says that God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And God is outside of our simple understanding of time and space. And the Bible says that through this one man, that death entered the world. And so as God is taking this dirt from the, the earth and he is forming Adam, he knows. He knows the depths of pain this creation will inflict on him. And I can imagine that God's righteousness and his wrath towards sin must have welled up within him and said, kill this creation. Kill this man. You know the pain he will inflict. You know the death that he will bring. Why are you creating this man? But still from a place of love. From a place of love. God continues to form Adam. The closest thing that I can liken it to is that love of a father and a mother toward their child. Now, for the parents here, I'm a parent myself. Please, I'm not bagging on our kids. I'm not trying to belittle the relationship we have with our kids. But if we're honest with ourselves, 
Children offer us no tangible benefit. There is no real value in the basic idea of what a child is. From the very earliest signs of pregnancy, worry and anxiety enter the, par- the mind of the parents. Then it's the coughing at 3 a.m. And it's the blood curdling cry after a loud bang in the kitchen. And it's as they go into teenage years, the phone calls with tears on the other line. Worrying never goes away. When a child is born from that point until the parent dies, they worry about the child. You could ask an 80-year-old mother if she still worries about her 60-year-old daughter, and I promise you she still does. But regardless of all of that, there is something innate in us. We just want to know our children. But they're going to cost you a lot of money. It's okay. I just want to know my children. They're going to cause you a lot of pain and misery. It's worth it. I just want to know my child. They may even grow hate you, but I will never stop loving. Yes, God could see down to the great expanse of time and space. And yes, God could see himself robed in flesh and a crown of thorns being shoved into his skull and flesh being ripped out of his back as he was whipped. And God could see all of this. He could hear the hammer striking the nails deeper into his hands and his feet. And all the while, it continues to form all of this pain for his creation. All of this agony for his child. Yes, they will turn on me. And yes, I will have to die for humanity, but I just want to know my children. I just want a relationship with my children. And this is the agony of a loving God. Please hear me this morning. There is nothing that God wouldn't do to have a relationship with you. There isn't any sin that could ever make it where God didn't love you enough to die for your sins. You are his child, and he desires nothing more than a relationship with you. We find an example of this relationship as God meets with Adam and Eve in the garden. And I have to imagine that there was So much joy and love in God's heart as he walked and talked with them every day. The Bible says that he would meet with them in the cool of the day, right there in paradise. And everything was as it should be. Until one day. Until one day and now everything has changed. Everything is different now. And he knew that this day was coming, but it doesn't make it any easier. She walks into the garden. And now we arrive at our opening text. And the Lord God called unto Adam. And he said, where art He steps into the garden, the the place that he meets with his child every day. He meets with his children and he walks and he talks with them. And he knows something is different. And he knows that something has been lost now. And he's saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? Where is my child, Adam? Adam, where are you? And it wasn't because God didn't know where Adam was. Nothing is hid from the eyes of God. But he wanted Adam to know it for himself. Please hear me this morning. It's been said already from those from this platform, or those from this, this pulpit here, that God is in this place this morning. 
He is here with you right now. And he is calling out to you. He is asking, where are you? Where are you? Adam, where are you? It is not because he can't find you, but it's so that we can confront the reality of where we are and our relationship with him. He has come here this morning to meet with you. He has come to walk and talk with you. And he is asking, where, where are you? As Adam and Eve stepped out from the shadows, the understanding of what must happen now weighs heavy on God. He is remembering all that they have shared. He is remembering the walks in the garden as they shared their sentiments, all of the laughing and the joy. And he is remembering the love that was in their eyes as they walked with their God. Adam, Adam, what did you do? Adam, where, where is the trust, Adam? Where is the innocence, Adam? Adam, Adam, where is the purity? Where is the purity? What did you do, Adam? Adam, don't you understand? You have left me no other option. And the agony of a loving God is revealed as the relationship with the world took over in Adam's life that God could do no more. He could do nothing but put separation between himself and his child that he loved so much. Adam, what did you do? The agony of a loving God was on full display as God began to pronounce the curse of death upon the children he had created. Don't think for one moment that God takes any of this lightly. Don't think that, that this relationship he has with you is something he does just to pass time. He wants nothing more than to walk and talk with you. But when sin enters into your life, he has no option but to put separation between you and him. But he still loves you so desperately. And this is the agony of a loving God. Don't try and tell me that a father who has to close the door on a drug addicted son, doesn't cry and sob. That a mother who has a suicidal child taken into custody doesn't scream in agony at night. Don't tell me that God wasn't in agony as he pronounced death upon his children. On the morning of Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, two teenage boys walked into a Columbine high school and began to gun down their fellow students. 20 minutes later, 13 people were dead and 21 more were injured. And a few minutes after that, both shooters committed suicide. And there is a book called A Mother's Reckoning written by the mother of one of the shooters. And she writes how the morning of the shooting, her and her husband began to frantically try to locate her son. But no one, no one had seen him. And she called around and tried to find out if he had maybe played hooky from school and, and if may, maybe, where is he? They didn't want to confront the reality that he was in the school and that he might be dead, shot by this school shooter. And as the police began to interview the students and the teachers that had escaped from the school, it became painfully clear that her son was one of the shooters. And what had been her innocent little boy the night before was now a monster that had murdered his own classmates. And a few days later, a local carpenter made a memorial wall with 15 crosses on it, 13 for the victims and two for the shooters. And understandably so, one of the fathers of the victims 
angrily ripped the crosses off of the display. And he turned to the cameras and he says, they deserve no forgiveness. And he breaks the crosses and he throws them away. The agony of a mother as she considers her son, a son that she had called her little sunshine boy, and the agony was that, yes, when you look at my boy, you see a monster. But when I look at him, I still see the innocence of the little baby boy. When you look at him, you see the face of a murderer. But when I look at him, I still see the face of a little boy running to give me a hug. Yes, he is guilty. Yes, he is a monster. But I still love him. The agony of loving something so hideous. Satan stands before God every day and he reminds him of the reasons why he shouldn't love you and me. Look at how, how they are full of hatred and evilness. And look at, they don't want anything to do with you. And look at, they are broken and they are worthless. They offer you nothing. Just cast them away. The agony of a loving God that loves a wretch like me. A wretch like me. Listen to me right now. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what the world or Satan says about you. It doesn't matter what you actually deserve. God loves you. He loves you. And when we look at our flesh, we see a monster. But when God looks at us, he sees a child that he loves. A child that he loves. Please understand, I'm not excusing sin away. I want to remind someone, it doesn't matter how horrible your sin is. God has made a way for you to return. I brought this Bible. Many of you are wondering why I have two Bibles. I brought this Bible with me today. And if I were to pass this Bible around this morning, you would notice just a few things right off the bat. One of them is that it says bonded leather on the back. If you know anything about Bibles, bonded leather is the leather that is the castaway leather from the other Bibles. It is the cheapest of the quality. If you have a bonded leather Bible here this morning, I'm not bagging on your Bible. I'm talking about my Bible right now. But it is the lowest quality. And if, if I were to pass it around, you would see how the edges are becoming frayed and, and there's little bend marks in it. And how the, the pages have been yellowed from the time and the years of using this Bible. How, how the font, it, it is too small. It's tiny. And because of the years, the writing inside of the Bible has bled through and, and is unreadable now. And from the standpoint of just the physical Bible, let's take out the fact that it's the word of God. A physical Bible, this is worthless in terms of the quality of this Bible. But I, I, want, I want to tell you a simple truth this morning. That when you have a relationship with something, it creates value. What you have a relationship with begins to make it more and more valuable. And suddenly the worthless, the worthless is priceless in your life. And this is why we must guard ourselves against who we allow into our lives. We may think that a friend won't have any effect on us. But you have a relationship and it begins to promote the value of them in your life. It begins to promote the influence that they have in your life. Make sure the relationships that you have in your life will not lead you away from the things of God. You see, this Bible has a lot of value to me. It was bought by my former pastor. And he called me into his office and I was just this little 12-year-old boy. 
And he handed me this Bible, and in the front of it, he wrote a little thing to me. And he said, Brandon, cling to this Bible for the rest of your life. And the pastor that gave me this Bible went on to give me permission at 15 years old to ask my wife to the Christmas banquet. And then a few years later, that same pastor gave me $1,000 to be able to buy my first car. Then a few years after that, that same pastor married me and my wife. And then a few years after that, that same pastor dedicated my firstborn son back to God. You see, you might look at this Bible and you might say it's worthless. And even after having told you why it's worth something to me, if I were to give it to you and you were to use it, it would never mean the same to you because you didn't experience the things that I have experienced that are attached to this Bible. Please hear me. When we see someone and we see a, a broken, a broken and a beaten down soul, we immediately have this judgment that comes into us. And we immediately say, that thing is worthless. That person is worthless. God doesn't see it like that. And when we see somebody and you know who they are in your life and you if we're honest with ourselves, are that person that fails time and time again and the same thing keeps tripping you up and you look in the mirror and you say, I'm worthless. I'm not like the other ones. I, uh... I hear them preaching on Sunday, and that's good for them, but it's not for me. If I really had the Holy Ghost, I'd get over this thing. And we look at ourselves, and we see this Bible that is, well, it's just broken. It's, it's not like the other Bibles. This Bible right here is goat skin, whatever that means. And it's nice and the font is beautiful. And actually this font was created by this company just for this Bible. You're only going to find this font in this Bible. Oh, this Bible is beautiful. This Bible's got a bunch of things going for it. But this Bible, this one is the one formed me as a young child. This is the one that means something to me. Don't you one time ever cast a judgment on somebody by their outward appearance. You don't know the battle that goes on inside of their mind. It is within our nature to cast judgment and to cast people away. When we have, when we have just determined within ourselves that they're worthless to us, God is not happy with that. But as we cast them away, God is standing there. God is saying, you don't know what they mean to me. You don't know what they mean to me. You didn't walk with them and talk with them. You didn't die for their sins. I did. And they mean everything to me. And the agony of a loving God. As he looks at someone broken that thinks they're disqualified and they can't approach him. They might be broken. They might be a mess. Well, let me change it. You might be broken and you might be a mess. God doesn't care. He loves you. He wants so desperately to be in a relationship with you and to walk with you and to talk with you. See this Bible here, it's not only good memories for me. The same. The same pastor that gave me this Bible and that married me to my wife and dedicated my firstborn son. He also walked away from this truth. 
a man that used to preach at Conquer's Conference, a man that has such a beautiful voice that when he would sing, the Holy Ghost would move, a man that meant so much to me. I remember the ways that he would pray before service. And his voice, his booming voice, would shake the 12-year-old boy to his core. And I remember thinking, I want a relationship with God like my pastor has. A few months ago, I looked him up on Facebook because I'm nosy. And I found a video of him. This is a man, like I said, he used to sing, he used to sing under the anointing. And, and I remember him preaching the word of God as tears would stream down his face. And now this man plays country music at a bar. Don't you know I wanted to be like you? I looked up to you. And as much pain as I feel when I interact with the Bible he gave me, as much pain as I feel when I stop and consider him, imagine the agony of a loving God as he watched his child, a child he had died for, walk away from him. And now in that relationship, God follows him around and he is reaching for him and he is calling and pulling for him. Come back to me. Won't you just come back to me? The agony of a loving God. And this is the main point that I want to make. Please understand, when Adam and Eve sinned, it created separation between them and God. And God knew, and God had agony that he felt in that. But in that situation, God had an answer. God knew that the penalty of sin for sin was death. And because he is a loving God, he knew before time had even started that he would take our place. There was no hesitation in the mind of God. He would die for our sins. And we could say, that this was the agony of a loving God, is that we have to die for someone and something that he loves. But I submit to you this morning. And the true agony, the true agony of a loving God is that as Adam and Eve were walking away from the garden, God was looking at the one thing he could not control. He could deal with their sins by paying the price. He could deal with their sickness. He could deal with their problems. But God could never guarantee that his children would ever return to him. And as they walked away, he didn't know, will my children ever come back to me? And the agony of a loving God is that he knows that some of humanity will never turn to him. He had gone from having this perfect relationship with his creation, with his children in the garden, to now there were some that would, even, that would never even know his name. Some that would never even talk to him. Some that his spirit would never live inside of. And there were some that regardless of the love he would show them, they would just ignore him. God would do everything he could to reach his children. He would forgive their sins as they offered up sacrifices. He would deliver them from Egyptian captivity. He would guide them as a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. He would feed them manna from heaven. He would part the Red Sea. He would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And ultimately, he would even robe himself in flesh and die for their sins. 
God will do the impossible to restore his relationship with his children. And he did all of this with no guarantee that we would ever return to him. If you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this one thing. The true agony of a loving God is that he is not loved. <laughs> is that he is not loved back. As I bring this to a close, I wonder if I were to walk through this room this morning and I were able somehow to pick up your life and to play it for everyone to see. And we were allowed to see your life. How many times would we see the hand of God reaching for you? How many times would we see a God that's standing there saying, I love you. Please come back to me. How many times has God maneuvered things in our life and reached for us? I'll tell you right now, if you're in this place this morning, this is evidence that he's reaching for you. This is that time in your life where God is reaching for you. If we had the video of your life, this would be a time where we would see the hand of God moving in your life. You might sit there and say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I've been baptized. I've spoken other tongues. I'm good. And nobody can, nobody can, can tell you like you can tell you. But look into your own life. And if it isn't as special as it once was before, let me ask you this. How lonely have you made God in his relationship with you? Does he walk in the garden waiting for you? Where is my child? I did all these things for them. Listen, I, I paid for your sins. I, I, I died in your place. You don't have to die. And, and now I've done all these things for you. Just come back to me. Just love me, please. And the agony of a loving God is that he is not loved back by the creation, by the child that he created. If you are here this morning, and you have, this is your first time, or, or you, you're just trying this thing out, and you're just trying to see what this is all about, and you say, I don't have a relationship with God. I want a relationship, but, but what must I do? What must I do? And I'm going to answer it the same way. But the church has always answered this for over 2,000 years. I'm going to answer it the same way that every preacher has stood behind this pulpit has answered it. You must repent of your sins. You must repent of your sins. That means you come to an altar or you, you find an altar in the chair that you're sitting in. Or you just begin to talk to God and you ask him, please don't look at God as some... Greek mythology where he's some God that stands upon this mountain looking ready to cast you down and to kill you at any moment. He loves you. Yes. He says in his word that if we, if we can give good gifts to our children and we are sinful flesh, how much more, how much more don't allow for the way that the world has built this theology around God that's sitting there ready to kill you at the moment you make a mistake. That's the furthest thing from the truth. He loves you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. All he wants is a relationship with you. He can deal with all of your, your failures. He can deal with all the mess that you've made in your life. Even if every single person in your life hates you for what you've done, he loves you. And when the longer you are not in relationship with him, it leaves him in agony. And so you must repent of your sins. And you must be water baptized in Jesus' name. And the Bible says that when we have done this, 
that we shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hear me. When we have repented and we have been baptized in Jesus' name, all of a sudden, the agony of a loving God, as he responds to your faith, as he walks into your life and he says, finally, finally, I am back in relationship with my child. Finally, finally. Finally.